Hello and welcome to Chapter 4, Species Interactions and Community Ecology. Okay, so let's look at species interactions. So first, intraspecific competition. Intraspecific competition is basically competition among members of the same species over, say, a common resource. So think two beavers fighting over the same food source. Comparatively, interspecific competition is a competition among members of different species over the same resource. So think of that same beaver, except one of the beavers, instead of uh, competing with another beaver, is competing against a bird. Now let's look at competitive exclusion. It's basically what it sounds like. So that's when one species successfully excludes another from resources. Again, species coexistence is basically what it sounds like as well. That's when two species are living side by side without really affecting each other. Now let's look at the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche. So a fundamental niche basically addresses an organism using all of its given resources. Comparatively, a realized niche is um, an organism only using some of its resources that are available because of competition with other uh, organisms fighting over those same resources. Okay, now let's look at exploitative interactions. So predation. Predation is essentially a predator hunting a prey. So you can remember that by predation, kind of sounds a lot like predator. Now let's look at parasitism. So again, you can remember parasitism because it sounds like parasite, and that's basically what this relationship is. So that's when one uh, organism lives off of another, the host, and does the host harm. Now coevolution is basically a long process of adaptions between a host and a parasite. So that's the host adapting to having a parasite on them. Now let's look at herbivory. Herbivory is basically animals and insects feeding on plants, thus retarding the plant growth. So think of an animal and an insect really depleting a plant, and so that plant's having a hard time growing back to its full um, size again. Now let's look at positive or neutral interactions, so mutualism. Mutualism is basically when two or more organisms interact in a manner that is beneficial to both. So you can look down here at pollination. A bee pollinating a plant benefits both the bee and the plant. A mensalism down here is when one organism is harmed while the other is unaffected, compared to commensalism, which is one species benefiting while the other remains unaffected. Okay, now let's look at ecological communities. So a community is basically just a group of populations. Okay, so let's break this down. So let's start with producers. So think of a producer as a plant, something that's a self-feeder. Those plants exist on the first trophic level. Moving down, there are next uh, three different levels of consumers. First of all, primary consumers. A primary consumer is basically, think of that as a plant-eating animal, and they exist on the second trophic level. Next, look at a secondary consumer. Secondary consumer basically preys on primary consumers, so you can think of a wolf eating a deer, and they exist on the third trophic level. On the tertiary consumer level, that's basically uh, a prey preying on a rodent that has already eaten insects. So think, for example, a hawk eating a rat, and that rat has already eaten an insect. And so that hawk would exist on the fourth trophic level. Okay, so uh, here is what we like to call an ecological pyramid. So on an ecological pyramid, you have your producers, your primary consumers, your secondary consumers, and your tertiary consumers. From here, there's something that I uh, wrote over here known as the rule of 10. So basically, you can see how the producers have 100% energy going to 10% energy on the next level, 1% energy, and then 0.1% energy all the way in the tertiary level. So basically, the rule of 10 is the idea that only 10% of the energy from the level before it is transferred to the next level. So that's how you get from 100% to 10, 10 to 1, 1 to 0.1. The rule of 10 is pretty important to remember, and so you can just remember 10% energy um, remaining from each prior level. Okay, so now let's look at food chains and food webs. So here's a food chain on the left and here's a food chain on the uh, food web, excuse me, on the right. So a food chain is basically a very a very simple way to just trace one linear progression of um, feeding in a certain ecosystem. Comparatively, a web shows all of the interactions between basically all of the living organisms and all of their feeding patterns being interconnected. So granted, this is even called a simple food web and this already looks somewhat complex, so you can only imagine if you take an entire ecosystem and you put all the living organisms and all of their feeding patterns together, you can really get a grasp of all of the uh, connections between all of the given organisms.
So next, let's, let's uh, look at a concept here known as a keystone species. So a keystone species is essentially an organism that has a very far-reaching uh, influence within its ecosystem. It's important to always have at least like one keystone species in your back pocket that you can yank out on an exam or a free response question. And the one I always like to keep is uh, the sea otter here. So the sea otter, it's incredibly important to its ecosystem. So a sea otter feeds on sea urchin. So because they feed on sea urchin, the sea urchin population stays at a reasonable level. However, say there is a decline in sea otter population. The sea urchin population would climb in the same rate, essentially. And so once the sea otters are going down, the sea urchin population is going up, and that would throw everything off. Uh, the same reason exists with kelp and sea otters as well. So a keystone species is imperative to an ecosystem, and the ecosystem really can't function without it. Okay, so now let's look at succession. There are two uh, types of succession. So first, let's look at primary succession. So essentially, primary succession follows a severe event, such as a volcanic eruption, in which no vegetation or soil remains. So that would be down here on the left. It's just bare rock. Uh, pioneer species is an important thing that goes along with primary succession. So pioneer species is essentially, essentially um, something such as a lichen, that colonizes the bare rock and begins to reestablish soil in life. So you can see down here, it starts as bare rock, and then progressively through, well, granted hundreds of years, um, trees and everything start to regrow and the forest comes back to normal. Now looking at secondary succession, which is down here on the right, that's uh, something that, say, a disturbance occurs, such as a fire, but does not completely destroy all the living things. So you can see there's a fire, and then you can see there's years in here where there's not very much vegetation. But then in 5 to 150 years, basically, um, down here in the graphic, the forest repopulates as well. Okay, so now let's look at invasive species. So an invasive species is basically a non-native species that competes with the native species over resources. So the book talks a lot about zebra mussels, so let's look at some zebra mussels here. So basically the story goes with zebra mussels that they were introduced into the Great Lakes. The problem is that these zebra mussels ate phytoplankton and zooplankton that the native fish depended on, that the native fish ate. So basically what's wrong with an invasive species is that a non-native species such as the zebra mussel is introduced and they provide another layer of competition to the native species. Now let's look at something called restoration ecology. So restoration ecology is basically scientists um, doing research into certain ecosystems as they, as they existed prior to modern development. And uh, basically restoration ecology is trying to bring back those um, natural systems. So you can think about wetlands. So a lot of people talk about wetland preservation and uh, reintroducing wetlands as a natural filtration system and everything. So that's a good example of restoration ecology, introducing wetlands. Okay. The book goes into detail on um, basically 10 main terrestrial biomes. So um, the book basically gives little paragraphs about each of these, so I'm not going to really go into detail because that's actually a pretty good summary that the book gives, but I'm just going to run over them quick. So basically the 10 are temperate deciduous forest, temperate grassland, temperate rainforest, tropical rainforest, tropical dry forest, savanna, desert, tundra, boreal forest, and chaparral. So um, you can go back to the book and just read those brief paragraphs, and those will actually give you a good understanding of these 10 terrestrial biomes here. Okay, so conclusion. So this chapter is basically about the complexity of the natural world and the interactions within there. And just as the natural world is complex, so are the interactions in the natural world. Okay, so next chapter, chapter 5, we're going to look into environmental systems and ecosystem ecology.